It's not over. We're not done yet. Just when you thought you knew everything about Doki Doki Literature Club, it comes back for more. It's time for a tale of sorrow, so protect your heart and your mind. Because we're about to blow this entire game wide open. But before I do, I wanted to let you know this video is sponsored by Amino. If you don't know, Amino is a free app that powers more than a million different communities, and they're heavily into the indie horror genre. Amino lets you see posts about all your favorite games and shows, like Doki Doki Literature Club, Five Nights at Freddy's, and even Rick and Morty. I'd highly recommend checking out the Doki Doki Literature Club community. You can not only join an extremely active community, but also find awesome fan art, videos, and anything else to fit your Doki Doki needs. We're on there under the Treescale screen name, so come find us and say hi! You'll be supporting Amino and supporting the channel. Click the link in the description to check it out! Now, let's get back into Doki Doki Literature Club. Ugh, you know what? I've, I've had a rough week. I could use some R&R &R with a few beautiful girls who are totally uh, not not psycho. And when we're talking about beautiful non-crazies, who would be better than these lovely folks? I mean, Ryan made it through a video with these four and he only predicted the end of the world, so th this analysis can't be that bad, uh, right? Yep, we're back with more mind-altering, pants-tenting video mayhem. This is the equivalent of mixing Adderall and LSD as we venture once more into the obsessive embrace of Doki Doki Literature Club. Last time, if you watched Ryan's video, he went over the actual implication of artificial intelligence on our lives and how we're probably all going to die thanks to our machine overlords. But me, I've got some things to say about these ladies and, um, well, I'm, I'm gonna say them. Now, if you've played Doki Doki Literature Club, you know the basics of the game. You're a high school. And you join a literature club thanks to the constant pushing and shoving of your best friend Sayori. The club is comprised of three other young lasses, Yuri, Natsuki, and Monika. And what do you know, all of them want to spend time with you. And I get it. Who wouldn't want to spend seven minutes in heaven with the Grantsicle? But the question becomes, who do you woo? And... How? Well, you win the affection of the girls through your innate sense of craft poetry fit for the gods. Whether you go with more Edgar Allan Poe-esque prose to entice Yuri, or engage in a writing style that resembles C-Spot, C-Spot Run, while creating undertones of emotion to impress Natsuki, you're bound to learn some interesting things from the girls from their poems. And that's where the true genius of Doki Doki Literature Club lies. If you actually take the time to read between the lines of these poems, you can uncover all the information you need about this game before shit hits the fan. But it's not just that, there's a greater importance to these poems than just an engine for the game to progress on. There's a deeper meaning than what you see on the surface. And that's what we're going to uncover today. When we talk to these girls, it's abundantly clear that there's more going on than meets the eye. Yuri is a prime example of this. Besides the few times that Yuri rolls down her sleeves as we enter a room to hide her cuts on her arms, there's also a lot we can learn about her cutting and how it began just from her poetry. Her poem, The Raccoon, is a perfect example of this. It reads, it happened in the dead of night while I was slicing bread for a guilty snack. My attention was caught by the scuttering of a raccoon outside my window. That was, I believe, the first time I noticed my strange tendencies as an unordinary human. Now, this is just the first stanza, but there's so much to dissect from just these three lines. First off, we know that Yuri finds the quote, slicing bread for a guilty snack, to be strange and unordinary. It isn't. People eat bread all the good derm time. It's like the most popular food in the world. Every culture has its own version of some kind of bread. And glorious, beautiful sandwiches are made with bread. So we can already tell that slicing bread is a metaphor for something else. Something unusual and something she feels guilty about. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been mentioned in the stanza. But we know from the title that the raccoon is vital to the poem. So we must keep an eye out for what this raccoon stands for. She continues, I gave the raccoon a piece of bread, my subconscious well aware of the consequences. Well aware that a raccoon that is fed will always come back for more. The enticing beauty of my cutting knife was the symptom. The bread, my hungry curiosity. The raccoon, an urge. Here, Yuri makes it much more apparent what's happening. That last line, the raccoon. 
an urge. Spells out exactly what the raccoon is. In the previous line, the bread, my hungry curiosity, lets us know that the bread is a metaphor for a curiosity within her, something that she fed to her own urges. This poem is a metaphor. There's no raccoon, there's no bread. This is an internal struggle within Yuri. Altogether, this stanza reveals so much about Yuri's character before we know it within the actual story. The enticing beauty of the knife reflects Yuri's obsession that we see later on. The bread, a curiosity to slice, to cut herself. And the raccoon, the urge to feel that pain, that feeling from the cut. And from the last two stanzas, she's become used to that urge within her, constantly feeding it, desiring it, and feeding it again. As she says in the last lines, a rush of blood, classic Pavlovian conditioning. I slice the bread, and I feed myself again. There's a rush of blood, and she's conditioned at this point to enjoy it to want it. And she cuts herself, and she feeds her own urge by cutting. It's all there if you're willing to look. And that is just Yuri's second poem, well before we see any real disturbance within her, well before she becomes obsessive over us, and well before she gives in to the ultimate feeling of self-harm. These poems are the path to these girls' true feelings, and Yuri isn't the only one. Natsuki's personality heavily defines her poetry, typically by being the exact opposite of how she acts. Her personality is brash, assertive, and blunt. But when she finally gets comfortable with you, she opens up to a more warm personality. Her poems, on the other hand, have the outward appearance of being warm, simple, and cute. But reading beneath them, each holds a sad concept lingering beneath the surface. Amy Like Spiders is all about the harsh criticism one can get for enjoying something unusual, something Natsuki heavily relates to regarding her love for anime. Eagles Can Fly resembles the uncertainty about opening yourself up to anyone. While every other species can do something, people can only try, but we may not always succeed. Succeed. We may let each other down, we may be wrong. People can try, but that's about it. Purposely flops on the ending to show that idea of failure within the poem itself, because the poem failed to end correctly. But the most telling poem we get from Natsuki is Things I Like About Papa, where we truly see the issues Natsuki has at home. I like when Papa comes home early. I like when Papa cooks me dinner. I like when Papa gives me allowance. I like when Papa spends time with me. I like when Papa asks me about my friends. All these lines seem innocent on their own, but before we even get into the rest of the poem, these lines should be a red flag that these things don't always happen. Sometimes her father stays out late. Sometimes her father doesn't make her dinner. Sometimes her father isn't around at all. And we see even more of these issues as the poem continues. I like when Papa asks me about anything. He doesn't interact with Natsuki very much at all. I like when Papa comes home before sundown. He stays out late, often very late into the night. I like when Papa cooks. Natsuki often has to make her own food for every meal. I like when Papa keeps food in the house, comes home without waking me up, uses his inside voice, no. is too tired to notice me. I like when Papa is too tired for anything. Her father is an abusive, angry, horrible shell of a man. He's a dick, argumentative, and whenever he's around, it's generally not good for Natsuki. Her father stays out late, doesn't think about Natsuki's well-being, doesn't give her money for food, and often doesn't have food in the house at all. And when he does interact with Natsuki, it's generally not good for her. This poem is a massive cry for help, and her coping mechanism is to be brash and blunt. Because she needs to fend for herself. She needs to care for herself because no one is caring for her back home. It explains so much about why she's so defensive, quick to anger, and secretive about her hobbies. She can't handle anyone else trying to put her down or make her life difficult. She's closed off from everyone because she's constantly on guard at home. Sayori's poems feel much the same way, as though they have subtle undertones that get more and more obvious with each passing poem. Of course, Sayori's last poem makes it abundantly obvious that she's having mental distress. So there's a pretty easy analysis there. I think she wants me to get out of her head. But her other poems, Dear Sunshine and Bottles, give us a better look into Sayori's mind. Dear Sunshine feels happy at the beginning, as though she's talking to the sun. She's not, of course. Sunshine is a metaphor for you, the protagonist. It's about how much of her happiness is entrusted to you, specifically saying that if it wasn't for you, I could sleep forever. 
aka I would die if it wasn't for you. This poem reveals how codependent Sayori is, but the poem Bottles shows the true horror inside her mind. I pop off my scalp like the lid of a cookie jar. It's the secret place where I keep all my dreams. Little balls of sunshine, all rubbing together like a bundle of kittens. I reach inside with my thumb and forefinger and pluck one out. It's warm and tingly, but there's no time to waste. I put it in a bottle to keep it safe, and I put the bottle on the shelf with all the other bottles. Happy thoughts, happy thoughts, happy thoughts and bottles, all in a row. My collection makes me lots of friends, each bottle a starlight to make amends. Sometimes my friend feels a certain way. Down comes a bottle to save the day. That seems nice so far. Sayori has all these happy, wonderful thoughts, and she uses those happy, wonderful thoughts to help her friends. But it, it doesn't stay happy for long. Night after night, more dreams. Friend after friend, more bottles. Deeper and deeper my fingers go, like exploring a dark cave, discovering the secrets hiding in the nooks and crannies, digging and digging, scraping and scraping. She's running out of happiness. She feels like she's expected to be the happy one, like everyone expects her to be the person to cheer everyone up. But she's running out. She's digging, scraping, looking for every ounce of happiness she has just to give it away. They were supposed to be for my friends, my friends who aren't smiling. They're all shouting, pleading, something. But all I hear is echo, 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 echo inside my head. She gave everything she had to her friends, every ounce of happiness she had. And yet they want more, they demand more, even though she's empty on the inside. All there are are echoes, echoes of the shouting, echoes of the pleading, just an empty space with nothing left. This is why Sayori is so bittersweet, so depressed when her outer appearance is so perky and happy. She's giving everything she has to put on that facade, when on the inside she feels nothing. She has nothing, and it's destroying her. This is before we really start to see her exterior crack and show the depression inside. These words were crying out for help, for someone to understand, and no one did. And last is Monica. Our sentient yandere obsessor also has clues within her poems that she is in fact a sentient creation within a game. Specifically, if you look at the Save Me poem from Act 1, you can really understand the torment she's in by knowing that she's nothing but a character within a game. The colors, they won't stop. Bright, beautiful colors, flashing, expanding, piercing, red, green, blue, and endless cacophony of meaningless noise. The noise, it won't stop. Violent, grating waveforms, squeaking, screeching, piercing, sine, cosine, tangent, like playing a chalkboard on a turntable, like playing a vinyl on a pizza crust, and endless poem of meaningless load me. This poem seems abstract until you take into account that Monica knows she's a computer program. The colors, red, green, and blue, are the primary colors used in computer imagery, and are the primary colors used in computers to make all other colors. Sine, cosine, and tangent are used to create sound waves, again showing that she is sentient and that she's a program. They create, as she puts it, violent grating waveforms. And the title Save Me combined with the end line Load Me is obviously representative of a game or computer program. This poem takes place in Act 1, long before we realize Monica is actually sentient. But again, the clues are there if you're willing to look at them. But why have I gone through each and every girl to show you that their problems each could have been seen before we ever actually encounter them in the game? The answer is that this isn't a game. This isn't something the developers just made up for a game. People are secretly having issues all the time, and sometimes they're major. Many of us have issues that we don't realize, that we don't feel we can talk about, that our society shuns us from having. These girls aren't just game characters. They're representations of the problems we deal with every day and never talk about. And sometimes, like in Sayori's case, we don't even understand the issues plaguing our own mind. We can't figure out why we aren't happy, why we aren't in love, why we are failing. This is one of the lessons of Doki Doki Literature Club. Writing isn't just about creating, it's about processing your life, bringing out the inner emotion that you can't seem to comprehend. 
It's a method of expression, of understanding, of sharing what we generally can't. Our society pushes us to shut the fuck up, to keep our problems to ourselves. In Doki Doki Literature Club, these girls have found a way to work around that by sharing their grievances within their poetry. Writing can be used as a coping mechanism, as a way to express what you can't say out loud, as a way to put your thoughts onto paper and out of your brain. It's underutilized and underappreciated, and it's one of the hidden lessons in this psychological horror game. Each of these girls is coping with their issues through writing. The poems were written for you to understand these girls, for you to see their cries for help before shit hits the fan. But it's also meant for you to reflect on your own life. What are you hiding from the world? What are you scared to let people know? What did you need to write down? We can share our lives through writing, even if the topic of our writing isn't ourselves. This game is just one example, and this channel and the videos on it are another. Look deeper into what people write about you. Look deeper into what you write about yourself. You'll be surprised what you find if you read between the lines. And maybe you'd avoid an unfortunate disaster because you took the time to write. In this game, you don't have the choice to confront the girls about their issues. But in real life, writing can help you become who you want to be, get over past trauma, and get you through hard times. This game is about sharing who you are and what you hide with others. The lesson is to share your experiences, to find camaraderie in others. That's the true power of the literature club. Before Monica fucked things up for everyone, this club was a safe haven for expression. It was the one place where Natsuki could read her manga without feeling judged. It was the place where Monica felt like she could start over and make something real. It was the only place where Sayori was able to bring out some sadness and let it go. It was the only place where Yuri could actually interact with others and feel part of a group. It was a place where people could actually free themselves of the shackles society put on them, and that is something worth looking for. The game might take a dark turn in the end, but the idea behind the game, the things you can find if you search just beneath the surface, that is worth looking for. And that's my take on Doki Doki Literature Club. It's a bit different than Ryan's, but um, then again, we are different people. But um, yeah, what'd you think? Let me know on Amino. That's all I got for today. I'm Grant, and I hope you all had a fantastic holiday and a happy new year. Bye, everyone. Every day, I imagine a future where I can be with you. In my hand is a pen that will write a poem of me.